It's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Hello brothers and sisters, it is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. A quick disclaimer about the video you are about to watch. It is a video that is about a religion and not a group of people. It is in no way a video that is anti any group of people it's not about race this video is showing the insides and beginnings of a religion in today's video i wanted to continue my presentation on the movement of the sabbatean frankists its impact on world history as well as its role in occultism. It's a story of mysticism, revolution, secrecy, and blood sacrifice. That would eventually lead to the Armenian Genocide, the spread of Wahhabism, and the establishment of Israel. As this is a two-part video, I recommend everyone go back and watch part one, if they haven't already, where I spoke about the roots of Sabbatai Zevi, Laurianic Kabbalah, and the Messianic Movement of 1666. With that being said, here is part two of Redemption Through Sin. Removed by almost a century since the Messianic mania of 1666, Sabbateanism still lived on in Europe, the Ottoman Empire and the port cities along the coast of North Africa. While there were different sects by this time, the Sabbateans were often held under a lot of suspicion and scrutiny, as they were known for their secrecy, tribalism and apostasy with many of the more prominent figures being connected to positions of power within politics, trade, and industry. There were a number of believers in Shabtai Tzvi who kind of went underground after the apostasy, but continued their messianic belief. And really for until Jacob Frank, a hundred years later, this community, this kind of subterranean belief in the, in the Messiah was semi-tolerated, occasionally persecuted, but mostly just kind of ran as an undercurrent uh, in European Jewry, mostly in Ashkenazic Europe and in kind of Northern Europe. What Today, royals, politicians, banksters, and businessmen form the inner circle of the Sabbatean Frankist elite. They live secret, two-faced lives, sometimes posing as religious Jews, or Christians, or Islamists. Modern Zionism is rooted in the unholy alliance of Frank, Weishaupt, and Rothschild. It has infiltrated world religions, taken over Freemasonry, engineered wars and revolutions, and turned nations and citizens into their debt slaves worldwide. Unfortunately, Muslims, Christians, and Jews do not recognize their common enemy because that enemy is invisible. It hides within their own religions. The enemy also hides within the activist community. It finances big budget documentaries and movements. The end game is to sell a divisive, anti-capitalist, atheistic message and deliver trusting followers right into the lap of a communist New World Order. New World Order, Mr. New World Order. Depopulation. Oh, listen, who, who are you? Genocide. Who are you televising for? We just want to let you know the New World Order has no legitimacy. Oh, yeah. And that we 
as a people, we're not afraid, and we are waking up to the robber barons and the big banksters who are looting this economy with the Federal Reserve. Well, what do you, I mean, the Rothschilds family did start the Federal, you know, they divided Europe first, no, no, no. took over Europe, the Napoleon. They're exaggerating. <laughs> One of the most influential proponents of Sabbateanism among the Don Jews was that of Jacob Frank, a religious leader of the 18th century, a self-proclaimed reincarnation of Shabbatai Zevi, who also would eventually claim to be the Messiah. Jacob came from a family of practicing Sabbateans who engaged in the merchantry of precious stones, linens and fabrics, traveling between East Europe and the Ottoman-controlled territories which was the centre of Sabbateanism at that time. During the 1750s, Jacob Frank forged close alliances with the leaders of the Sabbatean movement. A noteworthy incident, commonly referred to as the Las Koroni Affair, unfolded in Poland. Revealing a disturbing episode in which Jacob Frank, high-ranking rabbis and fellow Sabbateans participated in an orgiastic ritual. This event featured the consumption of non-kosher wine, dark rituals, and open orgiastic sex. The practitioners even engaged in sex magic that sacrilegiously desecrated the Torah. At the centre of the party was the wife of the local rabbi, naked with nothing but a bridal Torah headpiece on, being defiled by all the partygoers. Although sparing the more explicit details of the debauchery, word spread throughout the town exposing the participants and resulting in the arrest of some rabbis on the charges of indecency. Notably, Jacob Frank, being a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, managed to avoid being placed under arrest and was allowed to leave un- Is, um, that it, it does say that there is no such thing as evil. You know, th- these people have a belief that says evil is in the mind of the Gentile. Mm-hmm. And it's only because of their uh, lack of spiritual enlightenment that they believe that, that people are evil or that evil exists. Uh, but if they were of a better mind, they would not see these things as evil. It comes down to these teachings from Kabbalah, which says that, that you know, in this world there is no, there, there is no evil. Or, or it even says in um, another slightly different spin on the same thing, it says that evil in the world is there from the left hand of God. And because God has a left hand where all evil comes from, if we work evil in the world, we are doing God's work in the world. We are working his left hand. Scathed. According to Robert Zephyr in his book 1666, quote, Jacob Frank asserted that God, the Creator, was different from the God who had revealed himself to the Israelites. He believed the biblical God was evil. Belief widely held in Gnostic circles where Frank separated himself was by rejecting every moral law and commandment and declaring that the only way to a new society was through the total destruction of the present civilization. He insisted that child sacrifice, rape, incest and the drinking of blood were perfectly acceptable and necessary religious rituals. Unquote. When you look at the, the Gnosticism of his teachings, again, that the world was not created by the good God, that there are these three deities who kind of maintain the world. Similar, he doesn't use the term demiurge, but that there are these figures who don't have our best interests at heart. And they're not even really deities in the way that we might. He says at one point that these three mimunim, these three guardians of the world, actually take human form and they wield temporal power, but they are also in charge of kind of all of the terrible things that happen in the world. You know, at the foundation of his worldview is kind of what he sees as an impossibility that a good God would create this world that's filled with disease and death and strife. In 1756, at the rabbinical court convened in Santaniv, Ukraine, the Sabbateans were accused of transgressing fundamental Jewish laws on morality and modesty. This triggered a collective opposition from Eastern European Jews against the Frankists. Amid a prevailing climate of scepticism towards Jews by Christians, compounded by their recent expulsion from Kuanis, Lithuania, Jacob Frank and his associates found themselves under the scrutiny from both Jewish and Christian communities. Faced with the need to safeguard their well-being, they devised a strategic plan. 
Notably, Mikolaj Dabowski, the Catholic bishop of Kamieniec Podolski in Poland, harboured resentment towards the Jews, largely stemming from their association with the Talmud. In light of this, Jacob Frank sought an audience with him. The Sabbatines informed Mikolaj, the Catholic bishop, that they, the Sabbatean Frankists, rejected the Talmud and recognised only the sacred book of Kabbalah, the Zohar, which they claimed did not contradict the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Jacob Frank sought to align himself with the bishop, who was already very well at odds with the Jews who had their Talmudic observance. Jacob Frank's subversive actions led to the bishop guaranteeing the safety of the seemingly persecuted Sabbatean Frankists, and ordered the burning of all copies of the Talmud in Poland. Around 10,000 volumes were reportedly destroyed. With some level of favour among various Christian churches, who now saw the Sabbateans as less subversive than Talmudic Jews, many attempts were made at offering the Sabbateans conversion, guaranteeing them rights above other Jews. Many of the Sabbateans made false conversions for the sake of their own political expediency, but in secret they continued their profane traditions and observations of the Kabbalah. According to Robert Zephyr in his book 1666, quote, Frank totally rejected traditional interpretations of the Torah. He converted to both Islam and Catholicism. He often slept with his followers as well as his own daughter while preaching a doctrine that the best way to imitate God was to cross every boundary, transgress every taboo, and mix, as he claimed God did, the sacred with the profane. Unquote. Jacob Frank's false conversion to Christianity ended up providing him the opportunity to rub shoulders with nobility and people who would be considered among Central Europe's elite. The baptism of the Frankists took place at the churches of Lvov, which was celebrated by the Polish nobility. Jacob Frank himself was baptised in Lvov, 17th of September, 1759, and again in Warsaw the very next day, with King Augustus III as his godfather. According to Frank's own writings, he saw it necessary to act in secrecy, as he claimed, quote, Indeed, this is the principle of the true way itself, just as a man who wishes to conquer a fortress does not do it by means of making a speech, but must go there himself with all his forces, so we too must go our way in silence. It is better to see than to speak, for the heart must not reveal what it knows to the mouth. We are under the burden of silence. Here we must be quiet and bear what is needful. And that is why it is a burden. When a man goes from one place to another, he should hold his tongue. It is the same as a man with a drawing bow. The longer he holds his breath, the further the arrow will fly. Un this, is, uh, this is absolutely true. You can study, anybody can study the Kabbalah and they will find that these are core teachings fundamental, not extreme to one side. These are very, very central to the core because they say God is uh, uh, infinite without personality and therefore evil exists and they use the Kabbalah as the basis for understanding evil in the world and they say it exists but it's not really evil and specifically the Lurian Kabbalah. And you'll find that these people believe the same thing throughout time. Unquote. However, it wasn't long before the infamy and debauchery of the Frankists started to become a problem in Poland. The Frankists continued to be viewed with suspicion due to their strange doctrines. Frank was arrested in Warsaw on the 6th of February 1760 and was delivered to the church's tribunal on the charge of heresy. He was convicted and imprisoned in the monastery of a city in southern Poland. Frank's imprisonment lasted 13 years yet it only increased his influence by the sect by surrounding him with an aura of martyrdom. By 1788, Frank's influence had grown expediently. He and his daughter, as well as many of his followers, moved to Offenbach in Germany, where he assumed the title of Baron of Offenbach and lived as a wealthy nobleman, receiving financial support from his Polish and Moravian followers. 
who made frequent pilgrimages to Offenbach. During his later years in Germany and Poland, he would become acquainted with none other than Adam Weishoft and Mayer Emschel Rothschild of Frankfurt. According to Rabbi Marvin S. Antelman, in his book, To Eliminate the Opiate, Volume 2, we read the following. Quote, Frankfurt, at the time, was the headquarters of the Jesuit Adam Weishoft, founder of the Illuminati, as well as the Rothschild Brothers' financial empire. This is worth repeating. Frankfurt was the birthplace of both the Illuminati and the Rothschild Empire. When Jacob Frank entered the city, the alliance between the two had already begun. Weishoft provided the conspiratorial resources of the Jesuit order, while the Rothschilds contributed the money. What was missing was a means to spread the agenda of the Illuminati, and that the Frankists added their network of agents throughout the Christian and Islamic worlds. Jacob Frank became instantly wealthy because he was given a nice handout by Mayor Amschel Rothschild of Frankfurt. Unquote. Upon the death of Frank in 1791, Eve Frank, the daughter, became the holy mistress and leader of the sect. By this stage, Sabatine Frankists and those who belonged to the secret fraternal orders deriving from the Donmei Jews had spread their influence deep into Masonic lodges the nobility of various nations, and among various trade corporations which operated all throughout Turkey, the Balkans, and Western Europe. One of the most tragic events that took place in history, which was spearheaded by Sabatee and Donmei Jews, was an influential political movement at the turn of the 20th century, known as the Young Turks, which are irrefutably the ones responsible for the Armenian Genocide. The Young Turks were a revolutionary political force which operated under the guidance of a Judeo-Masonic sect, which, much like the Bolshevik Revolution which would take place a decade later in Russia, sought a coup d'etat. An article by the Department of History, Bill Kent University, Ankara, Turkey, highlights the reports of the British Embassy in Istanbul during the years of the Young Turks Revolution and shortly thereafter, which detail Freemasonry and Judaism were inextricably connected to the Young Turks movement. In light of these sources, and also Paul Dumont's research, which is cited in the same article, revealing the activities of Freemasonic lodges of Salonika, he argued that, quote, the role and relationship of Freemasons, Jews, and Ottomans and Young Turks were more interconnected than previously thought, unquote. The Sabbateans, led by Domme Jews, spearheaded the influential Young Turks movement, originating from a desire for constitutional governance in the late Ottoman Empire. The movement successfully opposed Sultan Abdul Hamid's absolute rule in the 1908 Young Turk Revolution. Their objectives included removing Christianity from the Balkans, establishing a segregated Jewish state in Palestine, and replacing Islamic power in Turkey with a manipulable, democratic leadership, which by proxy they could control. The Ottoman Sultan took notice of Shabtai Tzvi and gave him the choice to convert or die, and Shabtai Tzvi chose to convert uh, to Islam, uh, thus ending his mass movement uh, as a Jewish messiah. But the movement did not totally disappear. Uh, and for the next hundred years uh, in particular, there were kind of two main uh, ways in which it continued. Some uh, of his followers actually also converted to Islam and became kind of outwardly Muslim, but secretly Messianic Jude Jewish. These were known as the Dernma, uh, the turncoats. So it's not necessarily a term of, uh, of a complimentary term. Uh, and this movement actually lasted through the 20th century, which I find completely fascinating that there was this kind of open secret that these, uh, these, this group of Muslims were actually um, sort of not Muslim at the same time. Treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yochai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yochai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, A proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbi said, 
When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. Or when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots, too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ. Yet it's critical, even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, a rabbi may quickly object saying, I may quickly object saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish Encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject, giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish Encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. The movement adopted the slogan, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, also used by the Freemasonic Grand Lodge of France during the French Revolution. According to an article in the London Times on the 11th of July, 1911, page 5, we read the following, quote, It is a well-known fact that the Salonika Committee was formed under the Masonic auspices with the help of the Jews of the Domme, or Crypto-Jews of Turkey, whose headquarters are at Salonika, and whose organization took, even under Abdul Hamid, a Masonic form. Jews like Emmanuel Carasso, Salim, Sassoon Faraj, Mesla, and Domme or Crypto-Jews like David Bay and the Balj family took an influential part both in the organization of the committee and in the deliberations of its central body at Salonika. These facts, which are known to every government in Europe, are also known throughout Turkey and the Balkans, where an increasing tendency is noticeable to saddle the Jews and Domme with responsibility for the sanguinary blunders which the committee has made." Unquote. The Young Turk Revolution beginning in 1908 was a constitutionalist revolution in the Ottoman Empire, which forced Sultan Abdul Hamid to restore the constitution under the threat of war, at a time where ethnic clashes were already causing much instability in the region. In Albania, rebellion erupted, accompanied by assaults from Kurds and Bedouins targeting the German-constructed Hejaz Railway in Arabia. Concurrently, challenges emerged in Yemen from the Heshemite Sharif of Mecca, disputing the Sultan's authority as Caliph, and his control over the income derived from the Muslim sacred sites. The year 1909 witnessed the complete abdication of Abdul Hamid, 
paving the way for his brother Mehmed V to assume the throne. However, rather than abating, the decline of the empire only gained momentum. During this time, the Young Turks movement would be allowed to thrive, taking up positions of power within the government and military. In 1909, a purge in the army demoted many of the old Turks while elevating young Turk officers. After a successful coup in Turkey, driven by Dome Jewish revolutionaries, comprised of Sabbatean Frankists, the young Turks celebrated their victory by committing a seven-year-long spree of complete Christian massacres and persecutions. These events did meet some Armenian resistance, but they were put down fairly quickly and brutally. These events would ultimately lead to a deafening roar of anti-Christian hatred, which would set the stage for what would become known as the Armenian Genocide, an event which the Turkish government still denies to this very day, despite the abundance of evidence. As many as 1.2 million Christian Armenians were sent on death marches to the Syrian desert between the years 1915 and 1917, driven forward by paramilitary escorts of the Ottoman Empire, under the direction of these Sabbatean Frankists, which made up the ranks of the Young Turks. The deportation of Armenians and resettlement of Muslims in their land was part of a broader project intended to permanently restructure the demographics of Anatolia and allow for a change in Turkish leadership, which at the time controlled Palestine which was a big obstacle to overcome for the ambitions of the Zionists and bankers who would cede the grounds for two world wars to make Israeli statehood possible. According to Turkish historian Mevlin Zadar Rafat in 1929, in his book Inner Folds of Ottoman Revolution, he claims the following, quote, The Armenian Genocide was decided between August 1910 in October 1911, by a young Turkish committee composed entirely of displaced Balkan Jews, in the form of a syncretous Jewish-Muslim sect, which included Talat, Enver, Behadin, Shaki, Jamal, and Nizam posing as Muslims. It met in the Rothschild-funded Grand Orient Lodge Hotel of Salonika. Syncretism refers to a combination of different forms of beliefs or practice. Freemasonry fits that description, unquote. While in power, the Young Turks ran several newspapers, including the Young Turk, whose editor was none other than Russian Zionist leader Vladimir Jabotinsky. Because of their influence in the media and their positioning in alliance with the Zionist movement, the Armenian Genocide was denied and the covering up, or whitewash, plays out to this very day with suspicious focus on blocking any mention of Jewish involvement. This is evident by the fact that four large Jewish organisations, B'nai B'rith International, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, and the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, attempted to block the passage of two resolutions that were pending in US Congress that called for official recognition of World War I era killings of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire as genocide. The unprecedented brutality of the Armenian genocide marked a horrifying chapter in recent history. The systematic destruction of agricultural crops owned by Christian Armenians intensified their suffering. Women were forced into sexual slavery and organized executions resulted in mountains of bodies disrupting riverbeds and fostering disease. Overcrowded refugee centres and orphanages frequently turned away children, leading to malnutrition, abandonment, and tragically, death. It left a scar so large on Armenia, one of the oldest Christian countries in the world, that less than a third of Armenians in the world actually live in Armenia today. By the year 1917, the United States had entered the First World War in support of the struggling United Kingdom. That same year, the Balfour Declaration was revealed to the public, which brought attention to the already well-documented Zionist ambitions of the Rothschild banking dynasty. The Balfour Declaration was a letter written by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to Lionel Walter Rothschild, in which he expressed the British government's support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. One of the final steps expressed by proponents of the Yodid Yanon plan which has been echoed by Sabbateans for centuries prior, 
is the building of the third temple, which holds great significance in the realization of Messianism and the Kabbalah, which many believe will mark the revelation of the Jewish Messiah, which some claim will be a reincarnation of Shabbatai Zevi, although many Christians claim it will be marked by the arrival of the Antichrist, as prophesied in the book of Revelations. One more noteworthy pathway taken by the Sabbatean Domme Jews, which I will mention briefly in this video, which helps shine a light on the situation in the Middle East, especially in regards to Zionism and the persecution of Houthis in Yemen, is that of the Saudi royal family. Both Abdul Wahab and his sponsor Ibn Saud, who founded the Saud dynasty, were of Domme Jewish origin. In fact, on the Jewish Virtual Library website you can read a brief history of Ibn Saud, the first monarch of Saudi Arabia, which details how the British armed and financed his capture of the Arabian lands, now known as Saudi Arabia. The establishment of Wahhabism and the Saudi Arabian dynasty would reshape the cultural and religious fabric of the Middle East forever. The US Department of Defense has released translations of a number of Iraqi intelligence documents dating from Saddam's rule. 1. A General Military Intelligence Directorate report from September 2002, entitled The Emergence of Wahhabism and Its Historical Roots, shows the Iraqi government was aware of the nefarious purposes of the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, often known as Salafis, in serving Western interests to undermine Islam. Whether or not this is its purpose is unknown. But the influence Saudi Arabia has over the Islamic world, the oil trade, as well as the never-ending feuds in the Middle East, is undeniable. With these historical facts in mind, we should once again be reminded of Jacob Frank's self-admitted goals of remaining undercover and seeking out to control and destroy the religions of the world. By remaining under the cover of Islam or Christianity, they could further seek out the political expediency of their Kabbalistic intentions. It is mostly believed that the Sabbatean movement is at a standstill today, with very few sects operating openly in the world. Perhaps the descendants of these Sabbatean Domme Jews, which are situated all throughout the power structure of Islam, Catholicism, Freemasonry and Zionism today, have long forgotten the ambitions of their ancestors, or perhaps their agenda is still very real and playing out to this very day, hidden in plain sight. I'll leave that speculation up to you. Do the research for yourself and come to your own conclusions. This concludes my videos on Sabbatean Frankism for now. While I understand there is a lot more that could have been mentioned, it was really my intentions to merely introduce this subject. Perhaps we will revisit this topic again in the future in more detail. With that being said, be sure to keep your eyes out for the next video I do in the Occult Mystery series. If you have any requests or suggestions about topics that I should discuss next in the Occult series, let me know in the comments section below. Be sure to like the video, subscribe if you haven't, and share this video around on social media. Until next time guys, thanks for watching. Call up Holocaust, there is so much sensitivity. Well, if we go back to, and this is what's important, if we go back to the father of Zionism, Thomas Herzl, who was a, uh, an agent, he was an Ashkenazi Jew, he was an agent of Rothschild, this is what it states in his diaries. It is essential that the sufferings of Jews become worse. This will assist in realization of our plans. I have an excellent idea. I shall induce anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth the anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and oppression of Jews. The anti-Semites shall be our best friends. This is a quote from the diary of the father of the Zionist movement, an Ashkenazi Jew, which led to the creation of Israel. Okay, so when, when Ahmadinejad refers not to Jews, but to Zionists, which is a political institution, organization, and creation meant to tear up the Middle East because, as I said, the Persians are not stupid. They saw what the banking influence of Rothschild did in destroying the Ottoman Empire and recreating the, the Middle East after World War One in all these nation states, which the British, the Germans, the Belgians, the French, all came through and colonialized. 
and took control over. They knew that it, the, uh, the originating factor was not the Jewish people, but it was the Zionist creation of the Rothschilds. Today is Edward Henry. He's author of this magnificent new book that must have taken a long time to, 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 to research and write. I've talked to Edward Henry several times now. We've communicated also by email. I, I believe he really is a, a wonderful Christian man, and he cares about this subject, and God has put it on his heart. The subtitle is quite interesting. It's subtitled, Tracking the Beast from the Synagogue to the Vatican. Now, what could that mean? Tracking the beast from the synagogue to the Vatican? Does that whole, is that the solution to this mystery? Babylon the Great? Edward Henry, quickly, he doesn't brag much about himself, but let me, I'll brag for him. I'll toot his horn a bit. He's a very successful attorney, a lawyer. He's a Christian researcher. This is one of four books he's written. He's even written one about 9-11. And I don't think we're going to have time to talk about it. Maybe at a later time, his book on what really happened at 9-11. He's a sort of a hard-minded guy. I, I say that. He, he, you're not going to deceive this guy. You're not going to fool him because he looks at the evidence. He's an expert on the evidence. And uh, let me also say this, too. You may be shocked when we get into this, but he was raised as a Catholic in Roman Catholic schools, I suppose by nuns and priests and such. And, and then he went to maybe because of their football fame and such, the most prestigious university, although it has great academic accolades um, toward it as well, the University of Notre Dame. I've been there. They didn't invite me to speak there, but <laughs> I was there just to visit there in the South Bend, Indiana. In fact, I was on a Christian television program in South Bend. Uh, University of Notre Dame, though, everybody knows that is the Catholic school in America. And then he went on to another Catholic university uh, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, University of Detroit, and got his law degree, and that is a Jesuit school. So here we have a Jesuit-trained lawyer raised as a Roman Catholic, and he's written a book, and when you find out what the subject matter is, your jaw will probably drop. Edward Henry, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Well, thank you, Tax. It's good to be here. You know, th this book, it's a huge book. It's, uh, I call it large format because it's about the size, just the physical size of two regular books. Uh, and it's uh, 380 pages approximately, maybe a few less, 380 pages or so, which would make it about 700 pages if it was a normal size book. A huge encyclopedic book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. I guess what people would really like to know is... What caused you, a man of your accomplishments in the world, your education, what caused you, what compelled you to write a book like this? Well, uh, I was uh, saved a little over uh, 20 years ago. And by the grace of God, I was born again. And one of the many prayers uh, that I said and asked of God was for wisdom, that I understood that there was a l much deception in the world, and I asked him for wisdom, and uh, he has blessed me uh, with that. I take no credit for uh, really this book or any of my accomplishments. It's, it's all by virtue of uh, Jesus having chosen me. Uh, and saved me. Uh, and the the reason that I wrote this book, and this goes back uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, it seemed that there wasn't much information about the Roman Catholic Church. Because once I was saved, I had a real thirst 
to read the Bible. And as I read the Bible, as I'm turning the pages, and I, on every page, I saw that the that what Christ preached in the Gospel is diametrically opposed to what the Roman Catholic Church has as its doctrine. And I saw that page after page, and and my eyes were opened, and uh, it. At the time I was saved, I didn't understand that only until I read God's Word. And, but there was nothing, it, didn't, it seemed, out there as a resource for people to look to to find and compare the Bible to Roman Catholic doctrine. It just seemed that there wasn't anything out there. So I decided uh, to, to do that, to put together a, a book that compared biblical doctrine with Roman Catholic doctrine to show the error of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, in my uh, research in doing that, I, I, came, uh, I wrote a, a book called Antichrist Conspiracy, which began uh, initially as, as a project to do that. However, as I started researching and looking and digging deeper into the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and researching the history of the Catholic Church, um, I kept bumping into what was a grander conspiracy, a worldwide conspiracy, a, a conspiracy against man and God. And there seemed to be tentacles that were flowing from the Catholic Church to other organizations uh, that were the Zionist Antichrist organizations. Uh, and as I continued, and if you could think of an analogy, peeling the, the layers of the onion and going deeper and deeper, as I continued to research, uh, I, I kept bumping into uh, the influence of the Jews within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it seemed that as you went back in history, it became clearer and clearer that, in fact, the Roman Catholic Church was founded by a, a group of, uh, of uh, early Jews who inculcated uh, the Catholic Church with their Babylonian uh, religious doctrine, and that basically the Catholic Church is a Gentile front for a Judaic Babylonian religion. Um, it is today uh, controlled by the Jews, primarily through their another, another Gentile front, uh, the Jesuits. The Jesuits were founded uh, by Jews, uh, again, as a Gentile front. It became a, a, a Catholic priestly order, uh, and many have uh, focused on the Jesuit priesthood and some of the things that they've done throughout history because they are notorious for their conspiratorial conduct. But what most don't understand is they are a continuation of the Jewish Illuminati. And, uh, you know, this Illuminati goes back to the time of Christ. Uh, and the when Jesus talked uh, to the Jews, the Pharisees, the chief priests, and he was so critical of them, um, saying things like, you are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do, uh, he wasn't speaking, that was not hyperbole. Uh, he was revealing to us in his word the nature of their doctrine, and the nature of their conduct. And, in fact, if you read the New Testament, how they brought about the crucifixion of Christ was, again, the way they conduct themselves even today. It is, it is sort of a microcosm uh, in a few pages of, of the New Testament of uh, explains clearly what is happening today. They meet in secret. They plan out what they're going to do. They then get the political elements of governments that are um, titularly uh, Gentile to do the dirty work. 
And this is, uh, the book focuses on the core of this conspiracy. Uh, and it gets right to uh, the headquarters, if you will, of Satan. Uh, there is a devil. His name is Satan. Uh, he has been defeated by Christ, but he is at war with the followers of a Christ. He's in a rage. And uh, God, who is the author of, uh, of both the Old and New Testament, has made it clear that this uh, conspiracy is in control of the governments. If, you, if you'll notice, in, um, in, in, in uh, Romans 17, uh, the great harlot is riding the beast. That is, when you ride a horse, you control that horse. When you ride any beast, you control that beast. And so this conspiracy is controlling the beast uh, that uh, and this beast with seven heads and ten horns it, are the heathen governments uh, of the world. It does say that there are ten kings uh, and that they give all of their power unto the beast. Yes. So, and, and of course, doesn't it also say that this woman and the beast uh, dominate or control all the people, it's its kindreds and tongues, meaning languages and nations. Mm -hmm. So basically, as you said, this is a new world order conspiracy. Yeah, and the deception, you see, is is so uh, effective. It's as though the world is drunk, and that's the word, those are the words that God uses. The deception is, it, it's, it's, you know how easy it is to, to deceive somebody uh, if they're intoxicated, they're out of their minds. Mm. They don't know which way to walk. They don't know how to walk straight. And this religious deception is, is as though the, the world is drunk, you see. Mm. Um, and the, it's, it's easy when the devil uses his spiritual methods to intoxicate the governments and the peoples of the world so that they don't see what's going on. Now, Christians who are given knowledge, can see it clearly. They can cut right through it, because a Christian, a born-again Christian, has the unction of the Holy Spirit. And the, that is why the war is with the Christians. Well, Ed, although Christians are the main enemy, it's not only the Christians that are going to suffer. Isn't it just the entire population of the world? That's right. That's right. Even the even the the followers, you know, within the Roman Catholic Church and within Judaism, uh, are as much victims uh, as as Christians. Uh, they are cannon fodder, really, in a spiritual war uh, that has been won by Christ. Uh, the most uh, Jews and most Catholics don't really. Uh, understand the nature of their own religion, uh, interestingly enough. And and I say that uh, by virtue of uh, my research and my own personal experience, they are kept in ignorance uh, to a great extent. And much has been done by both Jews and, Catholic, and the Catholic hierarchy, Jewish hierarchy, hierarchy uh, to uh, shield uh, their adherence uh, from the truth. Uh, it. Uh, I can remember one time uh, when I was early on as a uh, as a Christian. Uh, I was uh, flying somewhere. I was in an airport, and uh, I had joined the Gideons, and we had these uh, little uh, New Testaments that uh, that Gideons would pass out, and I would always have uh, uh, New Testaments with me, and I would hand them out. And uh, uh, a, a child came by. And uh, he was probably, oh, I'm guessing, uh, maybe uh, 10 years old, 11 years old. I gave him a New Testament. And uh, he uh, was, he went back to his uh, father, who was uh, dressed in, in an outfit that clearly identified him as an Hasidic Jew uh, with the hat and, uh, and so forth. And he was wearing black. Uh, and 
uh, I saw him scolding his child when his child showed him what he had received, and uh, and I just it was interesting that um, the they do not allow uh, their uh, the, the Jewish hierarchy do not allow the Jews to be exposed to the New Testament. They do not want uh, any uh, you know uh, preaching of the gospel uh, to the Jewish adherents. Uh, they uh, uh, they view that as a threat uh, to their religion, as does the Catholic Church. Uh, if you know the history of the Catholic Church, you know that uh, throughout their history they have tried to prevent uh, the gospel uh, from uh, uh, reaching the, those that are within the Catholic Church. Uh, they, they will allow their Catholic catechism, uh, but even today, when you, when, when you see people going into the Catholic Church, they do not carry a copy of the Bible. They carry what is known as a missal, which is a, uh, a, a guide to the ritual that they go through during their their mass, uh, the ceremonial mass, uh, but they uh, there is uh, and they have selected Bible readings during that mass, but that's just a front. That's uh, uh, in order to uh, deceive uh, the uh, uh, those that are in uh, the Catholic religion into thinking that they are really Christian when in fact they're not. Uh, and we can talk more specifically about that. Uh, as we uh, as we continue our discussion, uh, but the um, the key here is that you have children of the spirit, and then you have children of the flesh, and that's those are how the battle lines are drawn. And the children of the flesh, okay, uh, their kingdom is of this world, uh, and it's in First Timothy, uh, the Bible states that the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, again, that is not hyperbole. Uh, these children of the flesh love money. That is the source of their power. And if you look throughout uh, the, the history of the Jews and the Catholic Church, uh, but particularly the Jewish religion, uh, they, they practice uh, usury, which is charging interest on loans, and that really is the source of their power. Uh, and if um, if you look at how it is they're able to accomplish that, it is it is it is so deceptive. It's almost like magic. Not one in a hundred truly understands how this economy works and why we have so many problems in the economy until it's explained to them. Until until the the practice of usury is explained. Now, most people think they know how it's done, but they all they all they understand is, oh, yeah, you have to pay a little extra on the money. Well, it's it's actually a little deeper than that, uh, and we can get into that if, if you wish. You know, it's interesting. As I read your book, and I read it uh, twice already, <laughs> and several parts more than once, uh, uh, Ed. So I highly commend the book. But as I, I read it then, and what you're saying to us is you, you really have two great spiritual elements here, or forces. You've got the synagogue of Satan, the Jews. You've got the Vatican, which is a billion plus uh, in its fold, uh, most of them totally ignorant of what really goes on. Uh, but the papacy, the Vatican the Jews in their synagogue of Satan, and then what you have just said binds up money, combines the love of money with these two spiritual forces and brings it all together. So you've got spiritual or satanic power of the soul that destroys men's souls, and then you bring in the money uh, that lures people in uh, as well. Is that why the woman, the whore that rides the beast in Revelation 17, She's got all these jewels and diamonds and pearls, uh, symbols of, of money. Is that the reason that she appears to be so powerful in the, in the money department? Oh, sure. She's acquired great, great wealth. And it's, it's by the deception. Uh, they, they, she has made the world drunk through her fornication. It is 
uh, just to, let, let me just illustrate the point for uh, as to what's happening in the world today. For instance, uh, take 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 the Federal Reserve. Okay, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed, uh, it was pre- it was presented to the American people, and most people viewed it as a government run uh, entity. When in fact, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. Most people don't understand that. They see their money, and they see Federal Reserve notes, uh, but that money is actually being uh, issued by a private corporation. Ed, let's, let's uh, hold on just a minute. Let's, let's, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. We're running out of time on this side. But hold that thought. When we come back, I want to ask you more about the Federal Reserve money and maybe what are its connections to the synagogue of Satan in the Vatican, okay? Okay. All right, my friend. You're listening to Edward Henry. He's my guest today. I'm Tex Mars. This is Power of Prophecy. Stay with us. We've got a lot to go uh, in tracking the beast from the synagogue to the Vatican, solving the mystery of Babylon the Great. Great. Ed, welcome back to the program. Thank you. You know, before we go a little bit deeper into the money situation and what the synagogue of Satan and the Vatican have to do with the money systems of this world, the Federal Reserve and so forth, I, I, I want to ask you again about your background, being raised a Catholic, going to the, the University of Notre Dame, and then, of course, going to a Jesuit school for your law degree. H- how much stress, how much how much distress did you go through in in, in and really accepting Jesus and becoming a born-again Christian, and then leaving the Catholic faith. You're an ex-Catholic. How did that feel? What, what went through your mind and heart? Well, actually, it was the, it was the working of Christ, and it, the, the process was itself, once my eyes were, 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 were open and the scales fell, and I realized what it was that the Roman Catholic Church was, I cut ties with uh, those institutions. I, uh, in, in, whereas prior to that, uh, I was an avid Notre Dame supporter. Uh, and, in fact, uh, when I was uh, attending school there, uh, we won the national football championship. Uh, and so it was a very exciting time to go to school there. Uh, that was the school for me, anyway, uh, as a Roman Catholic, to attend in the United States. And, uh, you, you know, the, uh, having gone there, I mean, I, I lived in Soren Hall, which is one of the oldest, uh, no, in fact, I think it is the oldest dorm room in the United States, dorm hall in the United States with single, with separate rooms. Uh, I would uh, get up in the morning and look out my window and see the Golden Dome right there. Uh, and so, uh, when reflecting on that, I view it, that is all done. Uh, it, it's in my past. Uh, while, uh, you know, just as John said, uh, when, when he saw the woman, he wondered with great admiration. Well, as a Roman Catholic, I would look at the Golden Dome and I would look at the surroundings and I, and I wondered with great admiration. But uh, upon being saved, uh, that is something that, uh, you know, Christ put in my heart that I'm to follow him. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I've kind of put in the past. So, Well, h- how about your career? Because obviously, uh, I mean, the Catholic Church has a lot to offer. I'm not saying you would get a job immediately with them. But, uh, you know, it's a nice, nice thing. I'm sure there are a lot of law firms that someday you might have wanted to work for or something that, you know, that are run by Catholics. The Jesuits have quite, uh, you know, a lot of people in law. Uh, so you're really sacrificing even there by cutting off uh, the papacy in the Catholic Church, weren't you? Well, it, you know, the uh, it would only be a matter of if the firm would know what my, my stance would be. Most firms... Uh, law firms, anyway, um, unless they're uh, you know Jewish or they uh, or they're Roman Catholic in a very overt fashion, uh, they wouldn't really know you know what what my feelings were one way or the other. Unless, of course, they now twenty years later have, you know with my book. So, you, in other words, if there's a huge law firm out there 
Uh, you don't expect to be offered a job as a partner there if the uh, if the uh, current managing partners are uh, Jesuits, right? After having written uh, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. If, if they knew about my book, I think that would pretty much, uh, you yeah. know, yeah. and that, uh, yeah, that, that would not be likely. Well, how about your parents? It was was your dad, your mom, what did they think about your leaving the Catholic Church? Well, uh, that's interesting. They, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't agree with it. And as much as I try to uh, reason with them, uh, they uh, they are staunch uh, Roman Catholic, uh, even to this day. So it's uh, and it's been it, it, it's been in di- been difficult. I try uh, you know I share the gospel with them. Um, I I pray uh, with regard to them, uh, but they are uh, they are blinded to the truth of the gospel. What if I were to tell you? Well, Ed, you probably should have stayed. I'm, I'm just being the devil's advocate, which I don't really like to do, but I will be at this time. You could have stayed with them. Look at all the good works that you could have done in the Catholic Church. I mean, and God would have really rewarded you. You might not have had to go through purgatory very uh, long because of these good works that you're going to do if you had just stayed with the Roman Church. What would be your response? Well, that's that's like telling a, a, a gambler who has a losing hand, uh, just keep putting more money in uh, because look at all the money you've already put in. Mm. But it's a losing hand. Oh. The the Roman Catholic Church has given people a losing hand. It is not true. They're being told that they have a winning hand. They're being told that in fact all they have to do is you know go through some purgation of their uh, of their sins in purgatory. Uh, but it's not true. There's no such thing as purgatory. Uh, there is heaven and there is hell. There is salvation. There is damnation. There is no middle ground. And uh, you know, there's the truth, and then there's deception. Uh, the deception is very effective because of the spiritual uh, aspect of it. The unseen spiritual world uh, that is being impressed upon the Roman Catholics uh, and really the Jews to deceive them. And, and this book really is, uh, in great part, a way of reaching Roman Catholics and Jews, uh, because they, there are many who have been chosen by God for salvation. I don't know who they are, um, but just because they're Jews today or they're Roman Catholics today doesn't mean that that's what they will be tomorrow. And the our obligation is to spread the gospel, spread the seed. If it falls on good ground then and it, and it germinates and springs to, into salvation, then that is according to God's will. But our obligation is to see that it gets out there. Uh, it's my hope that Jews and Catholics do read this book because then their eyes will be opened. They really have been deceived by the hierarchy of their respective religions as to the deception that's going on, and it's the the deception is 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 very seductive because it's so powerful. I mean, they have such great not only religious but political power in this world. You know, and, and you made a very good point early on that Judaism is not the religion of the Old Testament. Okay, uh, you know, it's 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 based on Babylonian traditions. And they're codified in the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Well, those traditions, okay, have been the basis for the Roman Catholic Church. And so the, the, if people viewed Judaism as the religion of the Old Testament, as what they read in the Old Testament, they would think that this book in some way was persecuting uh, the Jews. Well, in fact, it's revealing the very truths that Jesus reveals in the New Testament. Uh, And that is, it's not the religion of the Old Testament. Uh, It is a Babylonian religion. They have replaced God's laws with man's traditions, the very thing that Jesus criticized them for. And so their, their source of power, as I was talking about earlier, is usury. And 
just as when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, which, by the way, he had to do on more than one occasion, um, that's where we are. That's what we're faced with here today. They have uh, a virtual lock on the economy, okay, because of their control of money. And as I was indicating earlier, with regard to uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve pays for the paper and they pay for the ink, and the government printing presses print the dollars. But what happens is when the federal government runs a deficit, by law they must borrow the money from the Federal Reserve. Well, the interesting thing is the Federal Reserve, okay, doesn't have money to loan the government. What happens is the government supplies the money as soon as it borrows it. So the money comes into existence upon the government borrowing the money. And so the Federal Reserve gets enriched. Let's say the, let's say that the federal government runs a deficit of $800 billion. Well, on the day it borrows that $800 billion, the Federal Reserve makes that – well, it's actually done by computer – uh, transaction. So it's, but I'm trying to simplify it with, uh, if you can visualize it. Let's say I, let's say I were, I, I were the Federal Reserve and you were the federal government and you, uh, wanted to spend $20 that you didn't have. Well, or let's make it $100. Uh, you would, you would then come to the Federal Reserve. You would hand me the $100. I would hand it back to you. Okay. And then you would be able to spend it. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like a, a proper transaction because you have to have the $100 before I, and then give it to me and I give it back to you. That's basically what's happening. The, the federal government, when it borrows money, it's actually borrowing money. It's exchanging treasury notes for federal reserve notes. It then spends the federal reserve notes. The federal reserve notes are notes that do, do not bear any interest. They are, they are a debt obligation. The Treasury notes are also debt obligations, but they bear interest. So at the end of the transaction, the Federal Reserve has a, do has a document, the Treasury note, which in fact uh, gives it the, the benefit of interest, when in fact before the transaction they had nothing. Well, why doesn't the, uh, now I'm, again, being the devil's advocate here, but why doesn't the government uh, just print the money on its own? Why does it need the, the Fed if it's got to pay interest on its own money? Why don't they just cut out the Fed and say, we're going to print our own money from the Treasury? They could absolutely do that. They could absolutely mm -hmm. do that. That's what Lincoln did, and uh, purportedly that's what John F. Kennedy did before he was assassinated, uh, and they could do that. If you look at the history, that's exactly what Lincoln did uh, during the Civil War. They wanted to charge him upwards of 20 to 30 percent interest uh, on, on loans, and he decided, no, I'm just going to print what were known as then Lincoln Greenbacks. And that worked. And it worked. Okay. Now, you can argue the constitutionality of it, but clearly the Federal Reserve is unconstitutional. In fact, I'll go one step further. Uh, I will tell you that Federal Reserve notes are actually counterfeit. It's legal counterfeit. So they passed laws to make it legal, but it's legal counterfeiting because what the Federal Reserve note is is a debt obligation. It it is a it's supposed to be an obligation. A note is a debt obligation that purports to pay the re, the, the person who can, has that note something of value. And in the old days, it used to say pay to the bearer so many dollars of gold and so many dollars of silver. Oh yes, I remember those. I. At, when I was a kid, that's the only kind of bills that you had. I'd never heard of Federal Reserve notes. Yeah. Well, now they've taken off the obligation. And so now what you have is you have a note that has no payment provision. And so you, it just simply says that this note uh, is, is legal tender for all debts, public and private, which means that you can – give it to somebody and they re and they can receive it but you, you get nothing of value for it if you go to the bank and say i want gold coins or i want silver coins they they will simply they they won't have anything to give you now here's a question i ask you we only got a couple of more minutes again we're gonna we're gonna have another program uh, going even deeper in all these things next week but what is the money system got to do with the synagogue of satan or the vatican how, how are all these connected uh, uh together 
Well, the first of all, if if you step back, the Federal Reserve is is the is run for the most part by foreigners, and those foreigners happen to be Zionist Jews. Okay, those are the same Zionist Jews who uh, actually uh, control uh, the Vatican. They are also the bankers for the Vatican. He who pays the piper calls the tune. These are international bankers. So it, their, their scope is international. The Federal Reserve is simply the central bank for the United States, and it is run by the, these Zionist Jews. Okay? The, the, the turmoil that we see throughout the world, uh, just think, if you could print money, in other words, th- there's nothing you could not do. Uh, and if you go back to the concept in First Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. If you had a, an unlimited source of money, you could do unlimited evil. See? And mm. these are spiritual realities. The control of the government. Remember, Mystery Babylon, okay, is riding the beast. She controls the beast, okay? And part of that control is through the monetary system. Mm. And, so that no man can that, buy or sell? Wow. I see that. That's back. We're going back to the revelation again. No person can buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name or the number of the beast. I'm going to ask you about that next week, uh, Ed Henry. Well, listen, Ed, we're running out of time this program. It's been a great uh, thing to have you as my guest today. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your, your boldness, your bravery, but most of all your faithfulness to the Lord in researching and writing this great book. Thank you. All right. Ed Henry has been our guest, Edward Henry author of the brand new book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. Next week, we're going to talk about the synagogue of Satan being the banker for the Vatican. Is the Vatican in the pocket of the world Zionist money men? What's really going on behind the scenes? How is it going to affect your pocketbook, America, your family, and maybe even your life? This is Tex Mars. You've been listening to Power of Prophecy. And my prayer, my fervent prayer and wish is that you will join us each week and discover the power of prophecy. And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. We're going to dig right into the wall and uh, create a hole and look inside, and we're going to discover the mysteries, or the mystery, of Babylon the Great. This is part two of our uh, two-part series. We may have to go into three or four. I don't know, Jerry, uh, because <laughs> Ed Henry is revealing a lot of things that we haven't discussed in a long time. In fact, some new things, uh, newfound things uh, from his book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. But we're looking at the beast, the beast of prophecy and the whore of Babylon, the, the mother of harlots. And we're looking at the synagogue of Satan, the Vatican, the Jesuits, the money systems of this world. And your future, dear friends, that's what we're looking at. I don't know if anything could be more important than this. And as I see it, it's going to come crashing down on us pretty soon. And then eventually Jesus will return again. But I, I'm afraid of the horrors that will come even before Christ Jesus does. Of course, he will come whenever he wants to. <laughs> Who am I to <laughs> try to stop him? I'm not. I want him to come. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the Bible says. Edward Henry's written this great book. Now, Ed Henry, let me tell you again, if you weren't with us last week, he used to be a Catholic, very faithful Catholic, raised as a Catholic, went to Catholic schools, went to Notre Dame University in Indiana, and I've often thought the gold dome there, and then there's a gold dome on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Maybe God gives us a clue to things, you think? Hmm, even in architecture. Well, in any case, here he was. Graduate of Notre Dame. You couldn't get any more true blue Catholic than that, except you could if you went to a Jesuit law school, which he did, 
successful attorney. Why would he ever leave the fold of the Catholic Church? He had the bona fides. I mean, this guy was a blue blood. But somehow he read the Bible for himself. Somehow he said something's not right. A lot's not right. And God led him out of the Catholic Church. And now God has given him this book, this ministry, to tell how many thousands of others? We don't know, but I know many thousands listen to Power of Prophecy. And later on in the program, I'm going to tell you how to get this book, Solving the Mystery of Babylon the Great. I wrote the foreword for it, but it's just a beginning because then you're going to get in the book. And you're going to find out everything about the synagogue of Satan that you didn't know before. You're going to find out what they really teach in those yeshivas, those rabbinical schools. You're going to find out what the Pope is up to. What the Jesuit order, the black pope, is up to, and it's going to amaze you. You will, you'll be shocked. This is Babylonish, and it really is. Now, I want to welcome back our guest, Edward Henry, Ed Henry, H-E-N-D-R-I-E, author uh, of this book that I believe is going to be a, a bestseller, but that's, you know, up to God. Welcome back to the program, uh, Ed. Thank you. It's good to be here. You know, we could do a lot of kidding to start the program. I mean, Notre Dame, I'll never forget that year. I think it was 76, Jerry. Notre Dame, we were ranked number one in the country, the University of Texas Longhorns. Remember that we had Earl Campbell? We had to win that game. And we got beat 34 to 6. Say there, uh, Ed, Jan- uh, I, yeah, I, 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 Jerry even remembers the date of that, <laughs> that game. <laughs> yeah, that was the Cotton Bowl. The Cotton Bowl, that's right. I went down for that game. Are you kidding me? No, I was in Dallas. It was a cold day, I remember. Oh, boy, I tell you. Well, uh, things didn't work out right for the University of Texas, but I know one thing. I, I can see a big victory coming up for Christianity. What about you? Oh, yes. You don't think Notre Dame's going to lick uh, Jesus Christ, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I, didn't, oh, no. I didn't think oh, no. you would. Okay. <laughs> yeah. From the testimony of your book. You know, that's pretty mundane, though, talking about football. But you're... Your life, your book talks about life itself, about liberty in Christ, about the beast system. This is an important book. Maybe, maybe we can ask you the question: Why should somebody read this book? What's so important about it? What does the subject matter tell folks? Well, it, it goes to the heart of what is really happening today. It's um, it peels back the veil and reveals the man behind the curtain. Uh, if you want to uh, use the analogy of the Wizard of Oz, and uh, it shows you who's really pulling the levers uh, of this world conspiracy. Uh, it's a religious conspiracy at its heart. Uh, so people want to point to certain things like the mafia uh, and other organizations as being, you know, these the, as, uh, um, central to the world conspiracy. Uh, but in fact, it is really a theological, a, a religious conspiracy at its core. And all of these other factions are just, uh, they, they are in fact factions. If you want to view the conspiracy uh, in a visual aspect, you could think of it as like a circle. In fact, uh, one of the symbols uh, used in Satanism is a circle with a dot in the middle, signifying that Satan is at the center. And if you th- can think of the, the that dot in the center as being like a pie. Okay, now when you slice a pie, you would slice it in triangular fashion, all right? But the the devil is right at the center. And if each slice of the pie would be uh, one aspect of this world conspiracy, okay, Uh, but at at the center is Satan. So you'll have slices coming off from that center. But what this book deals with, this book deals goes right to the heart, those, those that are surrounding, right around the devil. Now understand this, the devil's defeated, all right? Christ defeated him at the cross. He has no power over Christians in a spiritual fashion, okay? Now he has, he has influence in the world, okay? But spiritually, we're impregnable to him. And not only that, the the reason that the devil does not manifest himself physically and must work through his agents is because he is defeated. Uh, the lowliest child who is a Christian could give him commands in the name of Christ, using Christ, not her, not not his or her own power, but using Christ 
uh, and his commands, and the devil would have to obey. You see, so this conspiracy is spiritual. It's concealed by its uh, by its very nature. It's concealed. Uh, it's concealed because it's required by uh, the devil because he is defeated. He cannot. He can only manifest himself to people who have established their bona fides to him. Okay, that they are in fact lost, that they are fully in his camp. Okay, but as far as m- making a general revelation of, of himself to people, no, he works through his his agents. Uh, and in fact, uh, what do we read in the in the uh, in the Bible about uh, uh, Judas? The devil entered Judas. Mm. See, and so we see that the devil enters people, possesses them, and he uses them to act. Uh, and he acts through people. So that so that those like Judas, who were possessed, literally possessed by the devil, before yep. he went forth and did his final betrayal of Christ, those same devils are alive today, and maybe they're in the Pope, the highest uh, chief rabbis uh, in Rome and in, in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? Exactly, exactly. And and it really, it really drives home the point when Jesus said, "You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father, ye will do." Again, sort of giving us a an indication of the nature of the opponent he was facing. Now, Jesus, you said there, Jesus told the Pharisee Jews, which is Orthodox Judaism, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. He said, "You're of your father, the devil." Now, now look, I've I've talked to so many Christians over the years. Uh, you know, I've been so blessed in the 25 years. Uh, that we've had power of prophecy ministry, and pastors have said, I don't understand the Jewish thing, Tex. I don't understand the Zionist thing. I mean, what's the big deal? Why is that important? I mean, after all, you know, all it really is is the Jews, the rabbis, believe in the Old Testament, and we have Jesus in the New Testament. So really all we have to do is give them Jesus, and they'll be like completed Jews. And they, they, they actually believe that Judaism is Old Testament and Christianity has just added the New Testament. But if Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil, they could not have been with the, the Old Testament, right? That wasn't of the devil. That's right. The Old Testament is of, of God. That's right. So, so obviously their religion was not of the Old Testament, and, and you're saying it's not today of the Old Testament, so what is their religion, the religion of the Jews? If it's of the devil, what are its components? How, what have you found out in your research and study? What is, why does the Bible talk about the synagogue of Satan if it's only the Old Testament? Okay, well, it's, it's Babylonian by source, witchcraft by nature. Okay, so it is, it is a religion of witchcraft. Hmm. And as an example... Uh, they have many magic talismans that the Jews use. You have the same thing in the Roman Catholic Church with their iconography. Their, it's the same. It's the same thing, only it is the Gentile version of the Judaic magic talismans. Magic is woven all through Judaism. Okay, now it is. Uh, in esoteric magic, it is not revealed to the the general populace. Uh, it is concealed even from most Jews. Uh, it is the hierarchy that is in tune with this witchcraft. It is the same way in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, people are, are they they worship idols. Okay, now the but they. The Catholic Church has has told them, well, we're not really worshiping idols. We look at the idol in order to give us, uh, bring to us, the, to mind the saint that we're praying for. For instance, well, that brings up another issue. That's the that's the witchcraft of necromancy, of of communicating with the dead, uh, which, by the way, uh, the rabbis do also. Uh, they engage in necromancy. So you, you, the parallelisms between what happens in the Roman Catholic Church and what happens in Judaism are striking. Uh, their doctrines are so close, and it really, when you when you look at the source for the Roman Catholic doctrines, uh, the source comes from Babylon, and it's through 
the Jews who brought it into the Roman Catholic Church, and in fact established the Roman Catholic Church uh, early on uh, in early Christianity. The Judaizers who were trying to draw people into their Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity were clearly known and clearly seen as a danger. Uh, the true Christians uh, saw what, what the Judaizers were doing, saw the danger of it, wrote about it, okay? They were not deceived, okay? Because as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they will not follow another. So the true sheep would not follow the Judaizers. But as you know, narrow is the way to salvation. But wide is the way to destruction. So while the few stayed away from the Judaizers uh, and that Judaic Babylonian form of Christianity, which became Roman Catholicism, the vast majority were enticed by it, were, uh, were you know, and, and, and in, in, you know, were convinced that that was, in fact, the Christian church. In fact, most Roman Catholics believe that they're Christian. If you tell them they're not a Christian, they will be, uh, they would be insulted. Uh, but, in fact, there's nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic Church, and nor is there anything Christian about the early Judaic Babylonian uh, uh, faction uh, that, that, that became the Roman Catholic Church. And again, if you go back to uh, Revelations chapter 17, what did John say about uh, mystery, the, Babylon the Great when he saw her? I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And so that was his response. Well, that's the response of, of many who see the Roman Catholic Church. They have this facade of piety, uh, but in fact, when you look at their deeds, their evil deeds, they manifest the true nature of the Roman Catholic Church. And, and their deeds truly are evil, uh, including uh, pederasty and, and all of the things that, are, that, that uh, have been in the news, uh, which is just the tip of the iceberg with regard to you know, the, the sins of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Ed, I, I used to be in the chaplaincy in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say in a past life, you know, <laughs> I know there's only one life you live before you go into judgment. But uh, I was in the Air Force for 20 years. I was in the chaplaincy for a number of years, and I worked very close with a uh, Jewish chaplains. Uh, and I remember the first chaplain I worked with was an Orthodox Jew, and his office was right next door to mine. And then a little later on, a few years uh, after that, I went overseas, and and uh, I worked with another uh, Jewish, uh, I mean, we didn't have the same religious services or anything like that. We were totally separate, but we worked together, you know. At least we were office together and knew each other and so forth. Uh, and that's the way sort of the military system was. Then then there was a, a Jew who was a, a, a rabbi who was what, he call, what I call, uh, actually he said he, he was a member of the conservative Judaism. I found it later on, actually, we would call it liberal Jews. <laughs> you know, but they call it conservative uh, Jews. So we're with two different kinds of rabbis. Now, the first rabbi, uh, one time uh, we went to lunch together and we were chatting, uh, and I asked this rabbi uh, how much emphasis was put on the uh, Old Testament, uh, and I was trying to sort of, you know, ask him what he knew about the prophecies that related to Jesus coming, you know, that are found in Isaiah and other places in the Old Testament. And he looked at me and he said, oh, we don't study that. We don't study the Old Testament. I said, you don't? He says, no, 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 no. We, we have another a set of books. And I said, what is that? He said, well, it's just another set of books. Well, you know, he, he didn't even tell me the name of it. I found it later. It was the Talmud. But he said, we study that because that, that, that is everything we need to know. That's what the rabbis, the sages, have told us. In other words, they don't study the Old Testament. And here's a man who's an Air Force chaplain. He's approved by the Orthodox Jews to come in the Air Force that shows that he certainly uh, meets their approval and their acceptance, uh, and he's holding worship services for Jews that are airmen, and he's telling me he didn't really study the the Old Testament. He didn't want to talk it over with me because he, he said, "Really, I'm not literate in that." He's, I know that you Baptists. I was a Baptist at the time. Now I'm just a non non-denominational non Christian. Just in other words, a Bible believer. 
But he said, I know you Baptists know the Bible better than I do, even the Old Testament. But we have our own books by our rabbi sages, and that's what we study. But he wouldn't even tell me what they were. Now, your book tells me exactly what he was studying, uh, Ed. You know what he was studying. But it's interesting that he admitted that he did not study the Old Testament, that other books were considered more important. Now, let me get to the point that I'm going to ask you this. It's said that the Pope is infallible in matters of doctrine, but he's just a man, right? Now here we have this Orthodox Jewish rabbi saying, Tex, we don't study the word of God. We study the writings and word of men. Is there a difference between that? What's going on here? How do you, how do you relate to what I just told you? There's clear parallelism between how the Jewish religion and Roman Catholicism. In, in Judaism, uh, their Talmud today is actually, the, those are the writings that uh, were the oral traditions at the time of Christ. Uh, and so the very thing that Christ criticized them for, uh, following their traditions, in place of God's laws, Okay, they've later codified into several volumes called the Talmud. Okay, uh, there's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Tal- Talmud is the more authoritative of the two, uh, and that is that is what they follow. The Talmud, uh, if you read it, and there's a fantastic website called Come In Here, which has about 90% of the Talmud uh, online. And people can read it. It's been translated into English. Well, it, you have a lot of it in your book. You have all kinds of uh, quotes I went, right I went, from the Talmud. I went through a good portion of it and picked out the, those things which were notable and were important for people to know. Mm-hmm. For instance, uh, the Antichrist nature of the Talmud. But the Talmud, in fact, all of Judaism, is really a religion whose focus uh, is on Christ, but it, the, it's on the hatred of Christ and the hatred of Christians. And I don't, I don't want to overstate it. And I, I explain with authority in in the book, point by point. For instance, let me just give you an example. Uh, in the Talmud, uh, they describe Jesus as right now being in torments, torments in boiling hot semen. Uh, that is how they describe, they blasphemously describe Jesus Christ. Uh, their Passover ceremony is, has become a ceremony where they attack Christ and Christians, and it is turned into basically a, a ceremony, uh, an Antichrist ceremony. So the Jewish religion... Uh, is really sur- the one thing all Jews agree on. No matter what else they disagree about, the one thing they all agree on is that Jesus is not the Messiah. They all are against Christ. They reject Christ, whether it's an um, uh, Orthodox Jew uh, or whether the, the person is a Reformed Jew, uh, even, the, even though Orthodox and Reformed Jews are really, uh, there's quite a controversy between them. In fact, Orthodox Jews don't even consider Reformed Jews true Jews. But the one thing that they both agree on is that Christ Jesus is not the Messiah. And that, that view of using their traditions to set aside God's laws and as codified in their Talmud, is found in the Roman Catholic Church as well. The Roman Catholic Church considers the magisterium of the Church to be the final authority. And that magisterium is made up of the doctrines of the Church added to the Bible. Now, what happens is, while they say that, what in fact happens is, it's their doctrines which supplant the doctrines of the Bible. So they say they've added, but they have actually over, uh, uh, supplanted uh, those provisions of the Bible, which are the gospel. And they've created their own religion, which parallels 
very closely the Babylonian religion. So the same, and the, 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 the infallibility of the Pope is derived from Judaism. Now, uh, you know, you mentioned in your book, and you, you prove, of course, and document, that the Catholic Church in its catechism, its new catechism, actually tells Catholics that in terms of a doctrine and faith, the final authority is the Church rather than the Bible. Isn't that true? That's true. I mean, they really they, they really blast fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians, and they say that the era that people like Edward Henry and Tex Mars would make then is that we have the Bible as our source, and they have the Pope. Well, and, and when you talk when you talk to a Catholic about what the Bible says, because they are kept in ignorance about what the Bible says, their retort usually is, "Well, that's your interpretation." Mm. See, and that's how you interpret it. But we have this long history. This church, which has read the Bible, and all their experts have said this is what it really means, and so we're going to go by what the what the Roman Catholic hierarchy has decided it means. So we don't have uh, uh, an interpretation. They, they say, by a man who's read the Bible. We have an interpretation that's officially stamped by the Pope. When he speaks ex cathedra, it is infallible, and therefore without error, and irreversible, irreformable. It is, it is the true doctrine, okay? And if you say something contrary, then you are against the Pope. The Pope has deemed to be infallible. You are not you're wrong. That, that's how they've been. That's how they've been conditioned. Well, now the, it's the, hard the to rabbi, that. the rabbi that uh, I worked with. Uh, now that I look back on it, he would probably say uh, my beliefs are based on what Rabbi uh, Maimonides said uh, back, you know, hundreds of years ago, or my beliefs are based on Rabbi Ben Eleazar, what he said. So they rely on. Uh, rabbis who are dead, and Catholics rely on popes, I guess, that are dead and and still alive, right? Yes, yes. It's a, it's either way, it's a, a parallelism. Uh, you know, when Jesus said then that to the Jews, he told them, "You have for your religion the the commandments and traditions of men." He really meant it. Yes. Well, I mean, you you, you can look at, uh, for instance, the Mariolatry of the Roman Catholic Church comes directly from Judaism. Wow. Uh, the queen now, now, hold, on, wait, wait, hold on just a minute. Now, that, yeah, that cannot be, because the Jews say we worship one God, he's a father God, and you Christians worship three gods, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They don't really understand, you know, what First John says about the three or one. But in any case, they would say, and the Catholics worship Mary, but we worship only a male, masculine God. But what really is the truth? Well, they actually worship the Queen of Heaven, and uh, and it's spoken of. Their worship of the Queen of Heaven is is spoken of and criticized by uh, by God in the Old Testament, and uh, and that Queen of Heaven. We're talking about Jews now. Jews actually worship a Queen of Heaven. That's right. Okay. That's right. They they worship the Queen of Heaven, uh, and they they as today they uh, and 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 in history they have done the same thing. It's a polytheistic religion. They, it is not a, uh, a a religion with with only one uh, one God. They have uh, uh, they have many gods and goddesses in their religion, and and my book explains that, uh, describes them, and uh, and cites their the, their own authority for it. That's a shock. A lot of this, a lot of this is esoteric knowledge, which is concealed, okay, from the ordinary Jews. The hierarchy knows about this, okay, in Judaism. But for the most part, uh, the the common Jews are kept in ignorance of this. So this is sort of like Ezekiel in uh, chapter 8 of, of the book of Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel was told to dig in the walls and see what you see. And then God showed him in, in a vision. He shows him what was behind the wall. And there were the elders of Zion, the chief rabbis, in other words, and they were worshiping all these other gods and goddesses and astrological symbols and that were painted around the walls. And the, the common average Jew didn't even know what was going on, right? That's right. That's and that's right. still going on today to a great extent. 
just a yes. journey. Wow. Uh, yeah. uh, Israel Shahak, whom I quote in, the, uh, uh, in my book, uh, you know, he said, uh, whatever can be said about the Kabbalistic system, it cannot be regarded as monotheistic unless one is also prepared to regard Hinduism, the late Greco-Roman religion, or even the religion of ancient Egypt is monotheistic, okay? And basically what Israel Shahak is saying is this is a polytheistic religion. And, uh, it, you know, they, they actually offer prayers to many different gods, including Satan. He states that uh, both before and after a meal, a pious Jew richly washes his hands, uttering a special blessing. Uh, on one of these two occasions, he is worshiping God by promoting the divine union of son and daughter, and, we'll, and that's talked about in another portion of my book. Uh, but on the other, he is worshiping Satan. Now, this is what is explained by Israel Shahak. Uh, now, who, who was Israel Shahak, and why should we... He's a Jewish scholar, mm -hmm. uh, and he has revealed many things about Judaism, uh, in his writings. Okay, I think he was a professor at Hebrew University, in fact, in Jerusalem. That's correct. Yeah, okay. So, the, uh, and again, the, the authority for what I say is found in the, the Talmud and the Kabbalah and the Jewish authorities themselves. And so, really, uh, it's hard for them to refute uh, what is said in the book because it comes from them. Well, probably what would happen... They, they're not going to debate you. They know you know. If a, if a rabbi, a chief rabbi, were to read your book, he would just shut up and call you a liar and every name in the book. But never would he want to debate you on the evidence, and I'm very positive of that. Well, Ed, we're going to have to go for a little break here. I'm going to tell folks how they can get your book, how they can order it. You must have this book. This is Tex Mars. You're listening to Power of Prophecy. Don't go away. We've got another full half hour, and we're going to talk about Satan, his synagogue, and his Vatican when we return in just a moment. Henry on the line with us from the great state of Virginia, a patriotic state, in fact. Edward Henry is a graduate of Notre Dame University, a Jesuit university, uh, University of Detroit. But uh, he's no longer a Catholic. He's just a Christian. I say just. Praise God uh, that he is a, a Christian, a believer, uh, and a great authority on this topic, having studied the Kabbalah, the Talmud, and the, the Catholic uh, doctrines, and putting it all together uh, in this book for you. Ed Henry, welcome back to Power of Prophecy. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, let me just tell you what happened recently. I was, re I was online and I read an article by a man who used to be a Methodist, and he's a very educated person. He wrote a very articulate article. He said he wanted to know what Judaism was all about. So, unfortunately, he doesn't know anything about the Talmud of the Kabbalah like you do. Hasn't read your book. Your book, in fact, just came out. But he says online that he wanted to visit a Judaic church, synagogue, and so he did. He said, I was raised Methodist, you know, to believe in social justice and you know, the gospel of helping the poor and all those things. So let's just say he was a liberal in terms of politics and so forth, a Methodist. And he said, I visited a synagogue, and to my surprise, he said, I loved the service. I loved the, they did the Jewish dancing and the music. I loved all of the symbols that they had displayed and so forth. I just loved everything going on in this worship service in this synagogue. And he says, then the rabbi got up. And he had on his talit, you know, and his, his shawl and all this and, and his um, robes and whatever and his uh, yarmulke cap, skull cap. And he said, but what impressed me was the sermon. He said the rabbi got up and praised President Barack Obama. And he, he said that President Barack Obama wants to help the poor with this Obama Medicare program. He says, now the conservatives, the Republicans and so forth are fighting it. But we Jews favor Obama Medicare program because we we care. And, and these Republicans, he said, you know, that are these Christian uh, conservatives, they are against this. But you know, we Jews want this program. He said, now to do a good work, you will support 
as a Jew the Medicare program of Obama and the, and the Democrats. And he said, so you write your congressmen, your senators and so forth, you phone them and let them know as a Jew you support this. And God will give you credit. It'll be a mitzvah. That means a good work. And in the world to come, you know, you'll get credit for having performed this good work that the Jews call a mitzvah. And this former Methodist said he was so impressed. He said that just, he said, I actually wanted to cry that touched my heart so much to, to, to realize that it would be a good work and, and that I would receive credits in the world to come that I decided to convert to Judaism right then and there. And he said, and now I'm on my way. He said, I'm going twice a week instructions in the synagogue, and the rabbi sits down with me and shows me the the beauty of the Judaic religion. And soon I'll be a full-fledged convert uh, to Judaism. I'll be just like all the other Jews, even though I was not born a Jew, Finally, thank God, I can become a full Jew. And it was all because I believe in Obama Medicare, and I realize how wonderful Judaism is. Now, I, literally, this is the message. This is what this former Methodist had to say. In light of all of your research, what would your response be in reading this report? It, this is a truthful story, by the way. Well, uh, my conclusion is he's been made drunk with the cup of the fornication of Babylon the Great. Let me just uh, uh, say this. One thing that people have to understand, in particular, and now that you've mentioned the Obama medical care plan, government is one thing and one thing only. It is force. Uh, it is not eloquence. It is not reason. It is force. Now, those aren't, those aren't my words. Those are the words of George Washington. He, in my view, is one of the foremost experts on what is government. He likened government to a fire. It is a fearful master and a troublesome servant. Again, those aren't my words. Those are the words of George Washington. And the reason that they framed our government the way they did was because they did not trust people. And they were concerned that government, when it gets out of control, can be destructive. Fire can be used for very good things. You can cook your food, you can heat your house. But if it gets out of control, the results can be disastrous. And that's the same with government. When, you, when you're talking about government, okay, if somebody can control that government, that is, control the force of government, then they can bring tyranny. Now, what many... I would say the vast majority of people do not understand is that communism is Judaism. In other words, the Bolshevik Revolution, which is now worldwide communism, okay, is the plan of the Jewish hierarchy, the elders of Zion. And when we're talking about using government force, and you read the book of Revelations, and you see that Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, is riding the beast. She's controlling the beast of government. Okay? This is the philosophy of that religion. It's come, it, it, if you want to know what Judaism is about, all you need to do is communist governments. Okay? They, that is a Judaic philosophy, okay, that controls the governments. When you look at, at the governments, in particular with regard to the, the, the health care plan, now stop and think about this. This health care plan requires a person to buy something that they ordinarily would not want to buy. The government is forcing somebody to purchase health insurance. It would be like the government issuing an edict. Well, we have we have a lot of wheat on the market. We're going to issue an edict. You must buy two loaves of bread today. It's so beyond the pale of the proper authority of government uh, that several courts in the United States so far have ruled it unconstitutional. And the reason that they require 
that people buy health insurance is because the government has done something else that is now unconstitutional in that health plan. They require an insurance company to insure somebody for a pre-existing condition. Well, they know that if insurance companies are required to insure somebody if they have a pre-existing condition, nobody is going to buy any health insurance until such time as they need it. It's like somebody crashing their car, calling the insurance company and saying, hey, I just crashed my car. I'd like to buy insurance and get it fixed. So the person breaks his leg. Hey, I just broke my leg. I'd like to get some insurance so I can have the you pay for it insurance company. Okay. It, what the government did was in order to prevent the people from doing that, it's forcing everybody to buy insurance under this plan so that people will not do what the insurance companies know people will, in fact, do if they're required to insure people for pre-existing condition. And so that's the silliness of this medical plan. And the reason it's being foisted upon the citizens is because the government is going bankrupt, and it needs more tax revenue. And that's why they're doing this. They're not doing this to help people. They're doing this to take away our liberty, okay, force us to buy something that we don't want. That men, I shouldn't say we. I should say that some people don't want. People should have a, the freedom to choose whether they want insurance or not. But that's what's behind this. The government is, is they, they, they have to take money out of circulation. They've inflated the currency to such a great extent. We're on the precipice of, of the collapse of the government, and this is a, this is a desperate effort to, to raise revenue, which they don't really have. Now, in Israel, all of the hospitals are owned and run by the government, and in fact, all of the hospitals in Israel require the hospital to provide free abortions to women. You know, I have a, a, a ministry that I know of that uh, gives uh, has given many thousands of dollars in, in gifts to a hospital in Israel. And I discovered that that very hospital uh, performs free abortions on Jewish women and even uh, advertises them. And uh, I asked the, uh, the head of the ministry about that, and he got very angry at me. He says, don't you realize, Tex, we're helping the Jews by supporting one of their hospitals. And I said, but they have socialized Medicare. They are like communists. They have socialized Medicare. They, they don't need your money. It's just extra icing to help them do abortions and such. And he got very mad. He said, don't you realize in helping Israel, we're doing God's work and God will bless us? Isn't that a little bit what the rabbi said? In helping the medical plan of Obama, you're doing God's work, a mitzvah, and God will help you in the next life to come or the next world to come. When the Jews, of course, have their kingdom, and their Messiah, not Jesus, rules over all of mankind, you'll be rewarded. And this former Methodist bought into it. Yeah. Do, do you think he really knows? He, he admitted he knew nothing. He said, I knew nothing about Judaism. But I, he was so inspired by that one service and what he had heard from the rabbi that he gave his whole life over to the, the Jewish religion, Judaism. Does that amaze you at all? Uh, it's really sad. It's really sad, and um, I'm I'm not surprised mm. uh, because I know of other instances where that same type of thing has happened. So, but it's it's a it's it's really a sad occurrence. What listeners have to understand is that in, in Israel, that is a pure communist country. The kibbutz, if you talk to any uh, any Jew who's been to Israel, the kibbutzim is pure communism in its purest form. And so the we've been deceived into thinking that this is the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, uh, how are you going to characterize democracy? We can get into a political discussion, but we have a constitutional republic here in the United States. It's constitutionally limited republic. Uh, democracies uh, are not necessarily the best form of government if it is not, if it does not have limits that protect the minority, you see, a, a pure democracy, if you want to think of it this way, is a lynch mob. The majority has decided somebody's guilty; they're going to lynch them. Okay, and if you're in the minority, that is the one with the noose around your neck. You're not going to think democracy is such a great thing. 
you'd like to have some laws there to protect you. And the idea is we are not a country of persons, but uh, a country of laws, if that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, but with communism, uh, the protections that are, uh, are given are, re- are, are, now, are now removed because our rights do not flow from the Constitution. They flow from God. That was understood by our founding fathers. We are endowed with uh, uh, inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. Jefferson used the, used the term pursuit of happiness, but, but properly it's property. In any event, uh, those are God-given rights. Well, communists is an atheistic form of government. They don't accept that a person has God-given rights. So the government in a communist country can do whatever it wants. And Israel is basically, a, then Israel is being a, 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 an extreme form of socialism. Now, in the communist system, they chose classes. So one class was superior to another class. And if you remember the communist party, you know, you might be given a very fancy uh, DACA, you know, apartment to live in or even a beautiful uh, mansion home uh, on the coast. But if you were not a member of the, uh, of the communist party, you might have to live three families in one apartment uh, you know, just really live uh, in a, a shambles or in a slum area. And, of course, if you were a Christian in the Soviet Union, you might end up living in a gulag. Now, in Israel today, is it not true that if you're a Christian, you will they will not even allow you to own land, only if you're a Jew? So they actually distinguish between religions. If you're a Muslim or a Christian, you cannot even own a piece of property. That doesn't seem to be democratic uh, to me in the in the terms that we think of democracy. What do you what do you uh, think about that? No, you're you're absolutely correct. And in that system, uh, whereas in in our system of government we have individual liberties, individual rights. 